We live in what appears to be an increasingly dangerous world. We want, we need to find a way of reducing those dangers. One of the keys to doing that might be the use of statecraft and leadership. I'm going to be talking to a range of experts about the past and the future of statecraft and leadership. Can we use those skills now to rescue us? Kristin van Bruskart is director of the Norwegian Intelligence School and an affiliate at the Oslo Nuclear Project at the University of Oslo. 70 years after the ascendancy of nuclear weapons, the risk of their use in great power conflict seems to us to be larger than ever. She and I have been discussing the rising nuclear risk. There's a lot of loose talk at the moment about the use of nuclear weapons. Do give us the facts as you see them. How close are we to nuclear weapons being used? And, and, and what are the various guardrails that are and are not still in place? So Russia has uh, an official policy when it comes to nuclear weapons use uh, that most people use as some kind of guidance with regard to understanding uh, what the Russian calculus looks like in the Ukraine war and what the likelihood is for nuclear weapons use in the Ukraine war. And that official policy uh, that Russia has uh, had as official policy for 20 years uh, basically states that Russia would only use nuclear weapons in wars that are existential, that would threaten the very existence of the Russian state. Uh, and most analysts will say that this conflict, this war in Ukraine, is not that kind of war. And several Russian officials have also posited that and repeated that official policy in the context of the Ukraine war. But then we've had a number of other statements as well from the Russian side that have caused um, speculation, uncertainty and, of course, a significant level of concern with regard to whether this is actual Russian policy, whether they would consider changing it in the current context and in the current uh, contingency that they're facing in Ukraine. Does the movement of nuclear weapons into Belarus suggest to you any kind of profound or meaningful change of, of, of that policy? I mean, the movement of nuclear weapons into Belarus would suggest a significant change in Russian nuclear policy because Russia has traditionally not placed its nuclear weapons on the territory of other states. So in that sense, it's a significant change. Whether it, significant, whether it represents a change with regard to the potential for Russian nuclear weapons use is a different question. And I think that my response to that question would be no, it doesn't necessarily increase the likelihood that Russia would use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. It's a very potent signal to the West, primarily, with regard to uh, how important nuclear weapons are for Russia and with regard to a key Russian grievance in the nuclear policy domain that Russia's had for many years, which is uh, the fact that uh, the United States has positioned its nuclear weapons on the ter territory of other states uh, in NATO in Europe. Um, so in that sense, uh, my understanding of this Russian move has been primarily a political one uh, with regard to positioning itself uh, in its uh, conversation, if you will, with the West. Who takes the nuclear decisions in Russia and so far as we can know this? In other words, if Putin made a decision, is there anyone who could countermand it, who could challenge it in any meaningful way? Mm. There, is, uh, there is some uncertainty regarding this issue. There is a limited amount of information available on this issue in the open domain. But the information that is available suggests that only Putin can make the authoritative decision with regard to nuclear weapons use but also that he would have to consult with uh, his chief of the general staff uh, and also with his defense minister. So the Russians have something called a nuclear suitcase in the US context, they talk about a, a nuclear football. In the Russian context, they talk about a nuclear suitcase and that there exists three such suitcases. These are suitcases that contain a communication system that enables them to issue 
a command to use or launch nuclear weapons. And the information that is available suggests that uh, two out of those three suitcases uh, that are supposed to be with President Putin at all times, with the G general staff chief, uh, Valery Gerasimov, and the Minister of Defense, Sergei Shoigu, two of those three suitcases will have to be involved in order to issue a nuclear launch. At least that's the information that's available. But there is a lot of things that, it, that there is not available information on with regard to uh, which two of the three. It seems evident that the president's suitcase has to be involved, but whether there are any uh, opportunities for um, overriding his order in this system, those are the kinds of questions that are uh, less certain, about which there is less information available, basically. Another thing you see very loosely talked about is, is the use of, of short-range nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. um, is, that a, is there a useful distinction to be made between the use of a short-range nuclear missile in the theatre in Ukraine and a, a wider uh, conflict or a wider um, uh, attack, or, or, or are the two so inextricably linked that it's it's not a wise path to go down? I mean, uh, there is, they are indistinguishable in the sense that the underlying technology is the same. These are all nuclear weapons, and nuclear weapons are distinct from conventional weapons. They are much more powerful. They will inflict a much greater level of damage. But having said that, the reason um, we talk about strategic and non-strategic weapons or uh, relate to their range, that is how far they can travel, uh, which is the reason some people will call uh, sub-strategic nuclear weapons short-range mm -hmm. nuclear weapons, like you now do, and mm -hmm. other people call them tacti tactical nuclear weapons. They can traditionally travel shorter distances than the strategic nuclear weapons. Uh, and they can traditionally also have a lower nuclear yield. So uh, a lower explosive power, basically, than the nuclear weapons that travel longer. But there is some flexibility involved here, because these days a number of the nuclear armed states have nuclear warheads that can be adjusted in, with regard to their yield. So that means that you can have weapons that can travel a short uh, distance, but the, that can have a very low or a relatively high yield. So these short range weapons uh, that many talk about in the Russian context, but also in the context of other countries, they can have a yield that range from something that is quite a lot smaller from, from what uh, was seen in Hiroshima, for example, mm. to something that's uh, uh, 10 to 30 times bigger mm. what we saw in Hiroshima, what you saw in Hiroshima. So that's a, that's a pretty large range. And these are all within that category that some people will call yeah. sub-strategic or tactical nuclear weapons. You make the distinction, obviously it is still a relevant distinction between nuclear and, and all other weapons. Um, does everyone, I mean to the extent that if Russia seemed to be about to use them, uh, or did, that the reaction, can we still be sure, I suppose is the question, the reaction of the outside world and, and particularly China would be what we sort of predict it would be, which is, would be horror. I mean, evidently it's very difficult to predict precisely how political actors will behave in a situation like that. But I think we have, we've seen a lot of signals that uh, not only Western countries, but also other countries such as China and potentially also India, uh, a range of nuclear armed uh, countries that they would react uh, with horror and outcry at uh, the prospect of one state crossing the nuclear threshold. In that sense, I think uh, there are quite strong indications that what some people call the nuclear taboo uh, still exists in international politics, that there is there is um, moral outcry and outrage and uh, con uh, associated with the prospect of using nuclear weapons. Another slightly technical question that then goes to that, because if there would be that horror, to what extent would it be possible? I and mean, you saw intel American intelligence uh, before Ukraine was invaded quite strong when it came to seeing what was going on and to telling the world about it. Would there be a warning 
uh, if Russia was changing its posture in a way that genuinely seemed to suggest it was going to use a nuclear weapon? Mm. Uh, that's, that's a difficult uh, <laughs> question to answer. That would all depend on the context and the situation. Uh, evidently, uh, one could have a situation where the Russians would want for there to be a warning, because what we have seen from the Ukraine war evidently is also the, the significant effect that rhetoric, that signaling, that threats with nuclear weapons have, and that's, that's part of their sort of unique characteristic if you compare them to conventional weapons. It's the mere threat of their use that also produces uh, a potential change in the behavior of your adversary. So when it comes to also prospective nuclear weapons use, I think a lot of people would uh, expect that the Russians would try to capitalize on that threat also in the lead up to potential nuclear use. But these are of course speculations and it's impossible to predict precisely whether that would be the road that Russia or another actor would go down or whether they would want to create some kind of strategic surprise. And both would be possible, I think. Have you been surprised by how much discussion there is of the use of nuclear weapons by, by people on Russian television, for instance, state television, where the, the, the messaging at one stage was that, um, well, we're going to use them, we're going to bomb London and all the rest of it. There's, there, there, there's a kind of wildness mm. that um, seems out of place when it comes to the seriousness of it, but also, crucially, out of place when it comes to sending that very strong message if you wanted to send it, because mm. they're already talking about doing it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, surprise to some extent and on certain occasion also almost uh, shocked and horrified uh, uh, at the ease with which some of these scenarios are being discussed. And there is an ongoing debate these days about, you know, what kind of effect that has on the Russian public as well, that this produces a sort of a normalization of the issue of nuclear weapons and of the issue of nuclear weapons use, which is a significant significant concern in it of uh, uh, itself. Um, so I would say that to some extent I've been surprised. I haven't been, I have not been surprised that the Russian leadership, the political leadership and the military leadership have tried to capitalize on this tool and this capability to the degree that they have. Uh, that, that has been less surprising because nuclear weapons have for a very long period of time been the most important security policy tool that the Russians have at their disposal and they've been quite explicit about it for a long time actually in the entire post-Cold War period they've been quite explicit that these types of weapons are critically important for their national security and that they are critically important also as a potential uh, compensation for their what they perceive of as their conventional inferiority when it comes to comparing themselves with the West. And then they thought, of course, that when they compare themselves to the Ukrainians, that would, they would come out in a more beneficial position than they have been able to. Yeah. Where does Ukraine, uh, and, and more widely, where does the kind of renewed conflict uh, with Russia uh, and potentially with China, where does it leave nuclear weapons more widely as, as we think of them as being designed to and successful at, to an extent, keeping the peace? There have mm. been many, many wars and many deaths since the Second World War, but, but not that big um, geo-conflict. Can they still perform that role, do you think? I, th I think they can still perform that role, but there are a number of uh, developments uh, these days, I think, that, that pose some significant questions with regard to how uh, stabilizing this role of nuclear weapons is to uh, international politics. Um, and I'm, I'm worried that the lessons a number of different states are drawing with regard to nuclear weapons from Ukraine is that they are more important than ever, that they can produce a significant political uh, outcome, at least uh, in certain um, contexts, and that uh, the kinds of behaviors and interactions that we've seen 
even so far in the Ukraine conflict, may produce a situation where a number of different states and actors for distinct and separate reasons will place even greater emphasis on nuclear weapons in the future. Give for example... Us, well, give us some, of, some examples of the difference in, in reasoning, because I can see a kind of crude one, which is, oh, if you've got nuclear weapons, you can't be attacked so yeah. easily. I mean, yeah. that, that's an obvious one, but yeah. you're suggesting there are, there are more than that. Yeah, so I think that's, that's the obvious one. Evidently, that people are concerned that Russia, this is the lesson R Russia's drawing. People are concerned that this is the lesson that China may be drawing from this conflict. And then there are, there are a number of reasons why I think the lesson uh, China may be drawing may look slightly different from that, including because the Chinese traditions for nuclear strategy formulation and the role and place of nuclear weapons in their strategy looks quite different from the Russian tradition. Russia's traditionally placed very large emphasis on their nuclear weapons. China's traditionally placed very uh, a, a relatively small emphasis on the nuclear weapons. That's why China's nuclear arsenal these days is about a tenth of the Russian one and of the American one. So the Chinese are, they've placed greater emphasis on developing other types of military technologies that they believe um, may be more useful for uh, coercion, for forcing an adversary to submit to their uh, demands, uh, but maybe they are drawing other types of lessons with regard to how you can use different types of military technologies to coerce, to place uh, pressure on, uh, to threaten a potential adversary. I think uh, Western states such as the United States, other uh, Western countries with nuclear weapons uh, and NATO as an alliance, they are drawing different conclusions from the Ukraine war. They are drawing conclusions that relate to Russia as an adversary that places such a great emphasis on nuclear weapons and they're anticipating that Russia will focus even more on nuclear weapons in the future. That means that NATO and the United States um, believe that nuclear weapons will have to play at least as important a role in their strategy in the future, if not an even more important role, because most countries still believe that nuclear weapons are the most effective deterrents of nuclear, deterrent of nuclear weapons use. And then there are other countries, uh, such as, for example, potential proliferators, that is countries that may want to uh, acquire nuclear weapons. The lessons they will be drawing from this conflict is that, first of all, it may be a good idea to have nuclear weapons because that may deter a potential adversary from attacking you. Secondly, that if you do have nuclear weapons like Ukraine uh, once had on their territory, it's not a good idea to give up those nuclear weapons. So this is all, this is all a, a, a number of, uh, or a set of bad news for, for everyone who's worried about the spread of nuclear weapons, the proliferation of nuclear weapons to, to even more states, which is a pressing issue in several different regions of the world. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you that. What, what is the global position now when it comes to those efforts, those, those anti-proliferation efforts? I mean, there are, there are ongoing efforts with regard to uh, producing a global ban on nuclear weapons, and uh, those efforts have made significant uh, progress with regard to having a number of states that have signed on to this ban, but uh, one of the challenges being that the countries that do have nuclear weapons have not uh, expressed any interest at all. Uh, in this uh, political initiative, and that of course uh, places some significant limitations on how much political outcome can actually be produced by such an uh, initiative. And then there are also uh, some challenges, uh, or at least a number of people uh, raise uh, questions with regard to whether those types of initiatives may be uh, undermining or whether they can be complementary to the existing non-proliferation regime, including the non-proliferation uh, treaty that, that uh, most states are working uh, relatively hard to try and uh, preserve and revitalize, but, but it's, it's constantly being challenged by these uh, different uh, initiatives and uh, diverse interests of the nuclear arms states. What is the state of that treaty at the moment? Because that's the central one that people think about, the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty. 
Uh, and exactly as you say, the think about the challenges to it as well. What, mm. what, what work is being done behind the scenes, if you like, to, to try to keep it in place and adhered to? Uh, some of the key um, initiatives in the context of the non-proliferation treaty and the, the permanent five, which is the UN Security Council, the permanent UN Security Council members uh, that are uh, signatories to the treaty, uh, was uh, to produce this uh, statement uh, a couple of years back now uh, with regard to how uh, that expressed or um, repeated. Uh, the uh, statement made by Reagan and Gorbachev regarding uh, nuclear wars and how they could not be won and must never be fought. And this was, uh, to some extent at least, a major, um, uh, a major win uh, for that deliberation within the permanent uh, five and within the context of the non-proliferation treaty as, as there had been a, a lack of uh, progress in those negotiations for some uh, time. But I think my impression is, uh, without knowing all the detail of the, of the sort of inner workings of the, those negotiations, uh, my impression is that uh, it, is a, it is a regime that is uh, under significant uh, pressure and that, uh, that um, where uh, significant work will be needed in order to make sure that this uh, regime actually survives mm. uh, in an era when a number of the uh, treaties and regimes that ensure uh, disarmament or uh, prevent uh, rearmament are being challenged, evidently. Does the re- uh, emergence of NATO, if I can put it like that, does the fact that so many NATO countries are now thinking, goodness, this is an alliance that's terribly important and we're going to have to fund it properly in the future, etc., does that assist in a way in that? Because it, it focuses people's minds more on the potential of conflict between the great powers and that very focusing of the mind makes people concentrate on this kind of issue in a way that, in a sense, we, we just felt the nuclear issue had slightly gone away. I think so, certainly, uh, and particularly so in the, in the regional context in, in Europe and in the transatlantic context of NATO. I think, you know, certainly uh, the current situation has produced in many ways uh, a, you know, a very different debate from what we've had in the past decade in the transatlantic context, where a number of people have been interested in revitalizing that debate and, you know, where there have been constant pressures also uh, from the US towards European allies to uh, take greater part in burden sharing, to increase defense spending, etc. Evidently, the current situation is is placing us in an entirely uh, different place with regard to that uh, debate. I think the discussions are still ongoing in European countries with regard to um, how and when uh, a number of promises that have been made will actually be realized and whether or not it's realistic. Evidently, it's, those are, uh, there exists a number of economic constraints and political constraints and there are questions with regard to you know, the long-term commitment to uh, this type of, uh, uh, well, basically what we are talking about is rearmament. And then there are all types of questions related to uh, how those efforts to build up a larger uh, European military force uh, can be reconciled with you know, future visions of a European security order that that's in some way or form will have to take into account the fact that Russia also exists as part of the European continent. Yeah, and, th and that's a really important point, isn't it? As part of the European continent, and also it will be, we mm. assume, uh, nuclear armed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that kind of, that's the underlying fact, in a way, isn't it, that we're going to have to deal with for, for, well, generations to come, so far as we can see. Yeah, and this, uh, this is one of my, my concerns as well, that, uh, that the, the political uh, and military changes and measures that are now, that are now being taken uh, on both sides of the fence, really, uh, both on the NATO side but also on the Russian side, are measures that will 
uh, continue, they are shaped by our current security environment, but they will shape uh, the European future for a long time. And that uh, the position that we will uh, that we will produce uh, with what I can only conceive of as a, sort of a new iron curtain in Europe with regard to rearmament and military dispositions, that that will be a situation that it may be quite difficult to get out of, even for a future or a potentially future Russian political leadership that may look quite different from what it uh, looks like uh, now. I think it may be difficult to convince uh, such a leadership that a rearmed Europe and a rearmed NATO has benign intentions vis-a-vis -vis Russia, and similarly uh, vice versa, uh, that it will take quite a lot for European leaders in the future to be convinced by other Russian leaders who try to convince European leaders that our intentions are only benign, we have no aggressive intent vis-a-vis -vis Europe. I suppose one of the questions there then is, and you think of how the Soviet Union ended, um, in, in part at least, because mm. it was outspent by the West, mm. and in part because they outspent it on nuclear weapons and, and nuclear technology. Um, is, is that a, a potential then for that Russia that you describe and the West to be engaged in a new arms race, a nuclear arms race, but one ultimately that Russia loses? Um, <clears throat> most people expect that, that Russia will be outspent in the sense that the Russian economy uh, is not looking uh, that solid, at least in the context of the current pressure that it's, it's being placed under with regard to uh, the sanctions uh, regime, uh, and that um, the drain of uh, both uh, people, competency, but also, and, and technological know-how, uh, but also resources uh, and, and the types of uh, components that Russia needs to rebuild its military, uh, that's going to place it under great constraint. Um, so, so in a sort of, um, in, in the larger scale of things, it may be possible to imagine that scenario where uh, Russia would be outspent uh, the problems start arising, I guess, when you start thinking about what Russia will look like on its way to becoming outspent and how uh, or whether uh, that will be a potentially a very dangerous Russia, as you say, armed uh, with nuclear weapons. Yes, yeah, so as a window of danger followed mm. potentially by a more stable situation in the longer term. Is that, is that at least potentially the way you see it? I, I think that's one way of, of seeing it. Uh, the question also, if, uh, if we talk about scenarios uh, that relate to you know, a West that outspends Russia in the military sense, is what, how that you know, potential uh, end or dissolution or well termination in, in some way or other of uh, Russia, what will that look like? And I think a lot of people um, <clears throat> would surmise that the peaceful dissolution of the Soviet Union was not necessarily a, a historical predicament. It could have evolved and developed in, in quite distinct and, and different ways than, than it did. So I think there are a number of um, challenges that would arise along that entire trajectory from the current point in time and through you know, uh, some kind of political transformation in, uh, in Russia. Christine. I don't think we should, uh, um, I don't think we should be sitting around waiting for a complete political transformation in Russia that will produce a country that looks entirely like ours. Kristen van Brunskar, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>